Today is Monday, September 11th, and it marks the 22nd anniversary of the radical Islamic terrorist attacks that killed some 3,000 Americans. If you're wondering where our president is today, it's not New York, not Ground Zero, not D.C., not Shanksville. He's in Alaska. Freaking Alaska. What a freaking joke and a half. The show starts now. Today, Americans who are not a-holes, Americans who are not the President of the United States of America, are mourning the 22nd anniversary of the September 11th radical Islamic terrorist attacks. May we also remember the other September 11th, 2012, the one where four Americans were killed in Benghazi. Someone wake up Hillary Clinton and remind her. But unlike Joe Biden, who commemorated the day in Alaska, where no such terror attack occurred, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis was in New York City meeting with family members and 9-11 survivors because that is what a leader does. Was there any way for leaders, intelligence agencies, or defense operatives to know it was going to happen on September 11th, 2001? Who knows, and we may never know. But guess what we should know by now? You don't let every Tom, Dick, and Harry into this country unvetted and undocumented and by the millions and then just hope for the best. But guess what? That is exactly what the Biden administration is doing at our southern border. Open. Just wide the hell open for the taking. Apparently, we've learned nothing from 9-11, and God forbid it takes another horrific tragedy to scare us straight. Let's hope it doesn't come to that. Uh, but I think we might be right on the brink, like a dozen or so busloads of illegals sent to blue cities close, to getting these loving and tolerant liberals to understand why this whole open borders thing is not only a recipe for disaster, but treason. We're getting no support on this national crisis, and we're receiving no support. And let me tell you something, New Yorkers. Never in my life have I had a problem that I did not see an ending to. I don't see an ending to this. I don't see an ending to this. This issue will destroy New York City. Destroy New York City. Wow, it only took tens of thousands of illegals dumped in his city for Mayor Adams to ditch that whole, we're a nation of immigrants and the Statue of Liberty says, bring me your blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that went out the window real quick. But this? This is treason, just plain and simple. And you know what else is treason? The Biden administration trying to finagle a way to keep all the illegals in Texas. Remain in Texas? How about, I don't know, I'm just spitballing here. Remain in Mexico? Here's the strategy and the only strategy that's going to work at this point. It's time to start ramping up the illegal immigrant busing to sanctuary cities. Absolutely inundate them. That's the only way to get any changes to border security. Not more funding, not more shelters. And if I were Texas Governor Greg Abbott, I would be securing every Greyhound bus in the great state of Texas, packing them full of illegals and sending them right to the doorsteps of Whoopi, Joy, Sonny, and Anna Navarro. Get it, girls. Love and tolerance sure looks good on you. And then however many who can't fit inside their luxury Manhattan high-rises will start divvying them up to the homes of anyone with this sign in the yard. <laughs> These people aren't so loving and tolerant when it's on their doorstep. Bet on that. And speaking of the whole loving and tolerant front, the facade, the cultural Marxism disguised as acceptance, my next guest exposed that crap at a school board meeting, and it didn't take much. All he had to do was read one line out of a so-called children's book. Take a look. Now on the topic of these pornographic books that you keep calling these uh, point of contacts on as it relates to whether they should be read or not. Um, 13 Reasons Why by Jay Asher, currently in Storm Grove Middle School and Freshman Learning Center. Page 265. As if letting him finger me was going to cure all okay, my you. problems, Sir, I'll stop but you in the end, Sir, I, I never stop told you, you there, to away. And then and we will did. continue you stop rubbing circles on my stomach. You there, Instead, you rub back and forth, please? gently along my waist. Your pinky made its way under the stop top it, of my please. panties Sir, and rolled back it. and forth you from here to here. You to leave. Thank you. Mr. Teske, would you remove him, please? Three warnings. Three warnings. I've asked you, please, to remove. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because you won't stop. You won't stop. I've asked you to stop. Allow the world to see me removed for reading the pornographic book. Okay, sir. I just said, I've stopped you from reading, it's going to be removed, so I'm going to ask you to go. We could use a thousand more like him across the nation. Amen. Author of a race, Pastor John Amanshuku, joins me now. 
Pastor John, it is so great to have you. And I got to tell you, I love that video. I know it went viral, of course, on social media and for good reason. You got to tell me what it was like being in that room, because looking behind you at some of the other folks in attendance at that meeting, they were just as shocked as a lot of people on social media at what you read and the fact that this book was accessible to children. So take me back to why you chose to do this and what the reaction was. Well, you know, there is an intentional plan to indoctrinate children into perversion in America. We see this taking place in all 50 states. We have perverts, losers, evil men and women who have a desire to put pornographic material at the fingertips of children. But when you take those same books and read them in a hearing during a school board meeting where you can have public co comments, these people want to shut you down. You heard the board cha board chairman say, you know, he he's had three warnings. Get him out of here. So they called the sheriffs to remove me out. You know, I'm a law abiding citizen. I back the blue. I support law enforcement. I'm anti-BLM. You know, I support the blue. But they removed me at the request of this board chairman who didn't think it was proper for me to read aloud what she has allowed for children to read in the public school system for several years. This stuff is insane. America has lost its mind. And so what I'm doing is traveling to school boards around the country, exposing this filth one school board at a time. You know, Governor Ron DeSantis did something similar a while back, and the, the press mm -hmm. conference was cut off. They didn't want to carry it, of course, yeah. on mainstream media because he did something very yeah. similar to you, just simply read the kind of books that they want in the hands of children. But I think a lot of people are confused because they see that this is going down at a school board in Florida, and they're thinking, well, wait, I thought Florida got rid of this kind of activity. I thought that this was now illegal in Florida. So tell me why something like this would still take place in a state that has gone probably further further than most to erase this kind of crap from children's libraries. Listen, we've all heard about the free state of Florida. Florida is doing quite well, but it still has an infestation of, of special interest and in individuals who sit on school board uh, councils and or uh, guidance counselors and principals and teachers who still seek to push um, these godless ideologies. Ron DeSantis has done a great job in Florida. However, they recently passed HB 1069, which states that if a book is read in a a school board meeting, and if that book is shut down and the individual is told to stop reading, then they have to remove that book. So there has been a, a quite a bit of incrementalism in um, Florida. They still have a lot of work to do. There are hundreds and hundreds of filthy books still in libraries in, in Florida. And so that's why I'm launching a national campaign to address these kind of issues, one school board meeting at a time. Florida is doing well, but they still Still have a long way to go. Florida is is really taking the lead on this because of Governor Ron DeSantis, and he's taken a lot of heat from the media first with the you know incorrectly labeled "Don't Say Gay," then so-called <laughs> book bans, everything that he has done, all the way to critical race theory. I want to touch on that with you because I know that you're very dedicated not only to getting all this gender ideology out of schools, but also this CRT. Uh, Ron DeSantis has taken a lot of heat for the new curriculum and some of the ways that it, it describes certain parts of American history. And I'm wondering if Americans who aren't as well versed on all this as you or I or people that are invested in politics, I wonder if they understand the point of getting rid of CRT and don't just simply believe the talking points from the left that Ron DeSantis or others are trying to erase black history because that's what I hear when I talk to friends of mine on the left who, who don't understand this. Can you help? the people understand exactly what's going on and why this is important? Well, first and foremost, there was a standard that was drafted in Florida that that stated that slavery benefited black people. And so a lot of people were angry and upset about that. I believe that the individual who drafted those um those statements that they probably meant well, however, it could be misconstrued. Slavery did not benefit black people just as well as abortion did not and, and still does not benefit black people. However, there are people who sit back and they wait for opportunities to race bait and race hustle. Critical race theory is a vengeance 
ideology. It's also a grievance ideology. It's positioned to create anarchy and confusion. It's ultimately cultural Marxism, where, where they seek to exploit the mentality of those who may not truly understand that they are being exploited and or used as puppets. I call uh, critical race theory the Jim Crow era in reverse. There was a time in this country where blacks were wrongfully disenfranchised. We were told that we could not drink at the same water fountains as whites. But who wants to drink from a water fountain today, right? We were told that we had to go to the back of a store uh, to get a fried piece of chicken. Chicken, okay, but today we don't have those same standards. However, it's equally wrong to label all whites as inherently racist because of their skin tone. And so what we are seeing by people strategically, be, uh, what's being done strategically is that they are using critical race theory to take us back to the 60s, take us back to the time frame of slavery. And they do that intentionally because they want to keep blacks on the liberal plantation. The question is, how do we keep black people voting for the failing uh, policies and politicians in the Democrat Party. We keep them angry about the past. We try to redefine the inception of America, focus on the 1619 Project versus um, 1776, find ways to pit blacks against whites and whites against blacks. And by doing so, they keep those who are not as skilled at understanding what has taken place, they keep them marginalized. You know, Lyndon B. Johnson said that he would have voting for the Democrat Party for 400 years. How did he do it? He passed the Great Society Act, where they removed the black father from the home and replaced him with the $400 check. And what I'm saying to black Americans and Americans in general, we need to open our eyes to the damage that the Democratic Party has done to America. If you want to see a party that pushes filth, look at the Democrat Party. If you want to see a party that pushes abortion on demand, look at the Democrat Party. If you want to know which party uh, resisted the civil rights era and the movement and the laws thereof, look look, look at the Democrat Party. If you want to know which party uh, was the party that was instrumental in propping up the, propping up the KKK, look at the Democrat Party. But the Republican Party is not a perfect party, but it's far better than the Democrat Party. It's the party of uh, Rosa Parks. It's the party of Abraham Lincoln. It's the party of MLK. It's the party of Frederick Douglass. And so we need to teach people the truth. But what I'm seeing, Tommy, is this. There are people who are preparing for the next election, and they're doing everything they can to stack the deck to win votes in 2024. And I'm saying to people who look like me as a black man, although they now label me as a white supremacist, you know, so I'm trying to practice this white thing, Tommy. I, I, I don't know if I'm doing well being a white man in America, but I'm as black as I as they can be. Um, but there, there, there are people today who are now witnessing the wholesale indoctrination of critical race theory and the lies of the left as a tool to keep us blind and in the past and in the dark. And I see through it, I know what's going on and I'm doing the best that I can to expose it. I'm wondering too, and, and there's a couple other things I wanna get to, but I have to get your thoughts on this. As far as the black community in the United States of America, it hasn't always been this pro-gender ideology, pro-gender expression. No. It feels like it's being pushed on the black community, being pushed on the he Hispanic community, two communities that were really kind of averse to that kind of thing. And now it seems like there's an extra special effort to push that gender LGBTQIA trans stuff. I think they're using <laughs> celebrities like Dwayne Wade and others that are pushing this yes. on that on the black community. Is it working? in the black community, and I'm not talking about the black community on social media or in pop culture, but in the actual black community, is this LGBTQIA stuff, is that working on your community? 
it's not working. There are many blacks who see what's taking place. Consider the progress flag. That's the multicolored uh, rainbow flag that also has a brown stripe and a black stripe. What's the significance of the brown stripe and the black stripe? Well, to the LGBTQIA plus community, it signifies that blacks went through the same level of discrimination as homosexuals have gone through in America, which is very condescending towards blacks because at the end of the day, Tommy, I didn't choose to be a black man in America, but a person chooses to be a pervert. <laughs> a person chooses to be a transgender. You can choose to practice sexually deviant behavior. My blackness nor your whiteness is a choice, but people choose their sexual lifestyle. And so what they're doing is they're trying to create a moral equivalency. They're saying, hey, Black America, come join us. We understand you. We know your struggle, Black power, right? We know what you've been through, but guess what? We've been through the same thing, and guess what? We, we'll pay you. We'll support you. We'll give you all the money. If you are a Black liberal politician, we'll give you all the support that you can possibly need to make it, to win your, your campaign, but at the end, of the end of the day, we need you to sell your community down a river. And that is what's taking place. Blacks in America are pushing back against this. However, there are many who don't understand what's really going on. Yeah, that's the, the risk that we run as well. And that's why it's so great that people are out there like yourself speaking the truth about what this is. And you're right. It's a manipulation. Last thing I want to address is a little bit of pop culture with you. This was obviously very viral on the Internet over the weekend, and that is Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis. At first, they wrote character letters for now convicted rapists and their 70s show co-star Danny Masterson. But they're getting a lot of heat for the video that they put out afterwards, kind of not really saying sorry, but understanding the hurt that they cause by giving a character witness reference for a rapist. Let's take a look at their so-called apology, and then I want to get your thoughts. We're aware of the pain that has been caused by the character letters that we wrote on behalf of Danny Masterson. We support victims. We have done this historically through our work and will continue to do so in the future. A couple months ago, Danny's family reached out to us and they asked us, to write character letters, to represent the person that we knew for 25 years. The letters were not written to question the legitimacy of the judicial system or the validity of the jury's ruling. They were intended for the judge to read um, and not to undermine the testimony of the victims or re-traumatize them in any way. We would never want to do that. And we're sorry if that has taken place. Our heart goes out to every single person who's ever been a victim of sexual assault, sexual abuse, or rape. Yeah, it was a very staged little apology there. And they can say whatever they want, but what they did is they wrote, you know, a character witness uh, kind of helping uh, a convicted rapist saying, you know, he was a good guy. He was a role model to us for so many years. He, he was somebody that really, really shaped us when we were young in Hollywood. I mean, what do you make of all of that? Listen, Hollywood gives a slap on the wrist to sexual deviancy. Many people who are in Hollywood know what it takes to make it to the top in Hollywood. It takes a lot of low living, and I'll, I'll just leave it at that, uh, to, to, to make it there uh, for many. And so what you just witnessed is probably the worst apology of all time. It was pathetic. It sucked. They did a terrible job at trying to protect their fame and their fortune. They really can care less about what is taking place. They just want to make sure that they are not canceled or de platform. They're trying to protect their interests now. They knew what they were doing when they wrote those character letters. They knew they were supporting a rapist. There's only one place for rapists. And I say this as well. Not only should we address the rapist today, 
that physically uh, manipulates a woman or a man and takes advantage of their body. We should also talk about the mental rapists also who are putting pornographic material into the libraries into the ed- and, and into the educational standards for our children to read. There's only one place for those people, and th- that's those individuals locked up behind bars. And so what we're seeing right here in this video is a failed attempt for two individuals to protect their interests, protect their fame, but really they can care less. A terrible apology. I appreciate your analysis on that and everything. And I know that you're working hard with your Erase Project, the Erase Book. We have images there for anybody that can go and and read it and watch what you do on a daily basis. You're speaking the truth. You're getting out there on the ground, the grassroots level. Pastor John, thank you so much for what you're doing and thank you for taking the time today. Thank you kindly for your support and thank you for sharing my video. You helped it go viral. Oh, absolutely. God bless you and we'll talk to you soon. You got it. Take care. All right. Well, now that we've covered one of the left's most beloved pillars, pushing gay porn themes on kids, we'll move on to another fond liberal obsession, climate change. When Biden's administration isn't going after stoves, light bulbs and ceiling fans, they're going after American truckers and our supply chain. Biden's EPA put out new emission standards for heavy duty engines and vehicles. And my next guest says these new standards will be disastrous, not only for truckers and their livelihoods, but for our supply chain and our food supply. He says these new restrictions are a blatant attempt to force consumers into purchasing electric vehicles while a national charging infrastructure network remains absent for heavy-duty commercial trucks. Here with more is Executive Vice President of the Owner-Operator Independent Drivers Association, Louis Pugh. Louis, thank you so much for joining me. And I also want to say thank you for looking out for the interests of American truckers. You know, trucking is a profession. It's a duty that a lot of Americans don't understand the significance of. They don't understand that what truckers do really is the backbone, not only of the U.S., but of the entire world. We certainly saw that in Canada with the freedom truckers, how important those individuals are. So I want to thank you for being such a strong advocate and getting the truth out there. I want to ask you about these EPA standards. I know that you've been very passionate about this, but what are these standards going to do to the trucking industry? Well, thank you for uh, the accolades and that. As somebody who's been a professional trucker my entire life, it's my pleasure to stand up. And you're you're right. These new these new regulations are probably going to put a lot of small business truckers out of business or could that could be the case. We've seen this happen so many times with EPA and their overreach. They they come up with these rules and these great ideas for the environment. And truckers want clean air. And I want to be, you know, we want clean air and want a clean environment. But you can't do that at a cost of putting people out of business with stuff that does not work. I mean, when they did this in 2011, it could be argued that it was worse for the environment than it was good for the environment. But, yeah, I mean, truckers were in 2018, we were brought to the table when they started talking about these things under Secretary Wheeler at EPA. And he promised me at the time the truckers were going to be listened to. Well, since Secretary or Administrator Wheeler has left, of course, and in a new administration, that hasn't happened. Truckers have not been listened to. Truckers have not been at the table and on these new regulations. And, you know, it, it's really easy to talk about these electric trucks, but, you know, a fuel truck, a truck with runs on diesel fuel, internal combustion engine, they can run 1,000, 1,500 miles on one fill up. Electric truck, 500 miles at the most. And we don't even know where we're going to recharge them. Yeah, that's the best point to make here as well for those who have this pie in the sky version of what electric vehicles are. You know, I'm born and raised in South Dakota. A lot of truckers in South Dakota, a lot of truckers go through South Dakota, through the Midwest, through the flyover states. And I'll tell you this, we don't have electric charging stations. Good luck. You want to drive your Tesla through the Midwest, through Montana, through Wyoming, unless you're in a little college town made up of a bunch of liberals wearing Birkenstocks and eating granola, you're not going to find a lot of charging stations for these hippies. So that's the part of this. It almost seems like they're trying to destroy this industry. And you'd think after the disaster that was the pandemic in 2020, people needing to get things, things being shut down, the essential workers having to carry the load, you wouldn't think they would do this again. So you got to help me understand, what do you think the motivation is if it's not just let's save the planet? I think that's BS. What do you think the real motivation is behind these standards? 
I don't know what the real motivation is because you're correct. You're going to cripple the nation with this kind of short-sighted thinking, unfortunately. You know, and the thing that they ignore that we bring up all the time, like myself, when my small business truck came in, I, had a, I parked my trucks at my home. So I fueled them before I came or after, or I even had diesel fuel on my property. Where are these guys who go home every night going to charge? There's also this massive parking shortage, which is epidemic proportion. We don't have enough. We have one spot for every 11 trucks to park at night safely. Where are these guys? They That's what they say. Well, they can charge at night. Okay, well, where are you going to park them? Because you don't have enough parking spaces now without charging stations. Where there's going to be all these charging stations? But I wish I knew what they were trying to do. But you're correct. They are going to put small business truckers and small business trucking companies in a very bad situation and probably out of business. What constitutes a small business trucker for Americans that are, they don't know the difference between you know, large scale, small scale? What's the difference and how is this going to hit small business truckers more so than maybe those that belong to bigger entities? Well, even big trucking is going to have a trouble with this, too. And, you know, that's a moving target of small business. Most of our membership, we have over 150,000 members, one to two trucks are all they have. That's all I ever had was one. I was owned one truck, one trailer, and did it all. So that's small business. But small business trucking makes up 95% of all motor carriers out there. You know, we see the big motor carriers, but 95% of motor carriers are small business truckers. So we need to keep that in mind. They are the backbone. And, and this isn't going to have just bad consequences on small truckers, but it's going to hurt the large trucking companies as well. I just read a report today that one of the companies that's producing electric trucks, they're having recall on all their trucks due to massive battery fires. So they got to get all these trucks to Arizona to have them look at them and figure out why the batteries are catching fire. And I can't imagine switching everything over to electric. You know, how many uh, children in third world countries are going to be mining cobalt so that we can get our Amazon packages in two days or less? I mean, liberals, they really are special people. They, they really don't understand the ramifications of their pie in the sky ambitions, or maybe they do and they just don't care. But lastly, even beyond just these new standards, uh, what would you tell the American people? What would a United States of America look like without truckers? Well, you wouldn't have anything. They're the people who bring you everything you have, from the clothes you wear to the food that you eat and everything in between. We saw it during COVID, well, how important truckers were to this country to get medicine supplies. So that's what's going to happen. It'll cripple our nation, cripple our country. And I, I'm like you, I have no idea what people are thinking. Yeah, you know, they're coming after industries, obviously coming after the fossil fuel industry, good coal mining folks, people that work in oil fields. They're coming after American farmers and ranchers. They're coming after American truckers. They're coming after all of these entities and all of these industries that really are so important. And they think that they're going to replace them with, you know, PhD individuals who've only gone to school. Well, best of luck with that. Louis, thank you so much for, for speaking to us, for trying to nail this point home. God bless you and all the truckers out there like you. Thank you, and God bless all the truckers out there. Thanks for what you do. Of course. Thank you so much. All right. Liberals are coming for it all, and they aren't hiding it anymore, just brazenly seeking to destroy what's left of our rights and our freedoms. Look no further than the governor of New Mexico, who thinks she can suspend the Constitution and come for your Second Amendment. Well, I have some final thoughts for that, Karen. Folks, we should have seen this coming from a mile away. Well, some of us did, but we were told to shut up. Democrats don't want to place some restrictions on your Second Amendment rights. They want to take your guns, and they aren't even trying to hide it anymore. Here is New Mexico Governor Luann Grisham thinking she is above the Constitution. You took an oath to the Constitution. Isn't it unconstitutional to say you cannot exercise your, your carry license? With one exception, and that is... If there's an emergency, and I've declared an emergency for a temporary amount of time, I can invoke additional powers. No constitutional right, in my view, including my oath, is intended to be absolute. Did you catch that? This Karen, Governor Karen, we'll call her, she has the haircut and everything. Well, she thinks she has the power to suspend the United States Constitution by declaring a public health emergency. Shall not be infringed, Governor Karen, not for 30 days, not for any days, shall not be infringed. 
This isn't about crime prevention either, and she knows that because she even acknowledged it. Madam Governor, yep. do you really think that criminals are going to hear this message and not carry a gun in Albuquerque on the streets for 30 days? Uh, no. But here's what I do think. It's a pretty resounding message. Flat out says that criminals and thugs and felons aren't going to abide by her little decree, but who is? law-abiding New Mexicans who have the right to keep and bear arms to protect and defend themselves and others from the thugs and the felons and the criminals who don't follow laws. But she knows that. They all know that. You know, I've been to Albuquerque and it's a hellscape. I couldn't speak at a university without state police and SWAT being called in. The state is a disaster and she leads it. This stunt isn't about cleaning up New Mexico. This is about infringing on rights because she thinks she's above the Constitution and above our freedoms. And here's the sad reality. They, meaning the leftists, will try to pull this public health emergency crap with more and more things. Why? Because the precedent was set in 2020. The only cure is a president of the United States in the White House who will not budge, not an inch. They want your guns, they want your money, they want your kids, they want your freedom, and you keep sending them back to state capitals and governor's mansions and school boards and city councils and to Washington, D.C. to represent you. What a joke. Those are my final thoughts. Be sure to like and subscribe. Outkick on YouTube from Nashville. God bless and take care.